Well, welcome to the Galloway Glen's final event, the Time Travelling Ecologist. And tonight we are we're going to be looking back in time, looking at some old maps that uh, the good people from the Dumfrieshire Archival Mapping Project have put together, um, put onto the National Library Service of Scotland website. And then with a bit of Galloway Glen's money and a bit of inspiration from Archie McConnell, who's one of our speakers tonight, and... Uh, and Chris Fleet at the National Library Service, we've digitised these maps, an extra layer, and we've pulled all the habitats out of them. So you can start analysing these habitats and having a look to see how, how the habitat was in 1790s to maybe early 1810s. And it enables us to interrogate the landscape with an idea that from that interrogation of the, the ancient landscape, we can maybe have a clue about what we could do for the modern landscape uh, if we want to restore things and understand where things have been, where things have worked. So it's an online event tonight, as well as, as, as uh, people in the, in the room. For those of you online, it would be great if you say hello in the chat box and uh, tell us where you're from. We've had people from all over the world in these events, from pretty much every continent, including Cumbria, which is pretty good. And, and we've also had... Um, you know, we, we get questions in from the audience as well. So ask your questions in the audience. Or we, we, throughout the, the evening, uh, at the break, we'll take questions from the audience in the room and we'll also take questions from the audience online. So without further ado, I've got two um, experts behind me. I've got Peter Norman from the Southwest Environmental Resources Centre, SWISIC. And uh, Peter's been with the Local Biodiversity Officer for Dumfries and Gallery Council for many, many years before he moved into this role and has a wide expertise in all sorts of biodiversity subjects. And then we have Alex, um, who's at the other end of her career. Um, Alex was originally employed by Galloway Fisheries Trust as one of the Galloway Glen's interns, and she's a self-confessed moth nut, or a moth botherer, I like to call her. And she knows everything there is to know about moths in this area and how the moths, you know, which moths have lived where, which ones are now in decline, and which ones are in ascendancy. So. Without further ado, Peter, if you'd like to come to the floor first and then hand over to Alex. Good luck, guys. Uh, thank you, Nick. I'm going to talk about, I've been handed the job of talking about meadows this evening. Um, so for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to give you a rundown of, of meadows in the Ulston estate, which is where the maps are, but also uh, wider afield. So, meadows, I'm going to begin with a little quiz for the audience. Um, the audience in the room, but those of you at home can play along as well. These species here, what have they got in common? It's an easy question if you think about the subject I'm talking about this evening. They're all called meadow or something. Well done. Right, for bonus points, <laughs> what are they called? Start at the top, right, the butterfly, meadow brown. Next one along, close, meadow grasshopper. Next one, meadow pepet. Next one, meadow sweet, the grass. Meadow foxtail, it's getting tricky now. <laughs> Any guesses? Sorry? It's meadow, meadow, meadow rue. Next one, meadow crane spell. And finally, the most difficult of them all, the fungus. No fungus experts in tonight. Meadow coral. So all these species have meadow in the name, and there's many other ones that I could have included that also have meadow in the name. So you'll think the name meadow is something to do with ecology. Uh, and today it is. You can buy lots of books that are called How to Make a Wildflower Meadow. And that's not the orig original name of meadow. It's an agricultural term. It's not an ecological term. And uh, it comes from the Old English to mow. And all meadows would have been mown for hay. And we've been doing this in Britain for a long time. In fact, we've been doing it ever since 
um, metal bladed tools were invented. Originally, we were doing it um, from clearings in amongst woodland uh, and then riversides, and then we came into having specialist fields set aside as meadows. And through nearly all of that time, all meadows have been managed by hand. Um, machinery only came in in the 19th century. This painting here, 1898, machinery would have been, horse-drawn machinery would have been in place by then, um, but the artist has chosen to depict the meadow being mown by hand. And hay was essential for, for keeping your livestock alive over the winter. If you didn't have hay, you couldn't keep your livestock alive over the winter. And if you, if you couldn't keep your livestock over the winter, then you didn't have milk, you didn't have meat, but also you didn't have a plough team. So next year, when you come to plough your arable land, you wouldn't have um, arable crops. So hay was essential, but they couldn't produce enough of it to keep all the livestock alive. So most of the livestock was killed. November used to be known as the blood month because that's when the livestock was, was uh, slaughtered. But the livestock that they wanted to keep uh, over the winter was fed on hay. Here's the map from the Gremlin project of the Austin estate. Um, dating roughly between 1799 and 1817. As you can see, the estate is divided up into three different packets, three different portions here. So where were the meadows on this estate? That's where they were. Those green marks show the meadows. So as you can see, they're scattered quite widely across the whole of the estate. And the meadows, um, ranged from quite high altitude down to quite low level. On this particular estate, they range from 300 meters above sea level down to 50 meters above sea level. Where were they on the farms? Well, I've done an analysis of the, uh, the, the maps and um, out of, I've, only, I've only looked at the northern section, but out of that northern section, which consists of 21 farms, Meadows are found on 17 of them. And even the other four, which don't have meadows, had meadows very close. So I suspect there was a bit of meadow sharing going on. They're just about all located next to watercourses. You can see the map of Log there, which is the most northerly of the meadows, next to a watercourse, and it's got a minor watercourse running through the middle of it. But the other place that they were located was in hollows between hills. And you see the other map of Colmark, strange shaped meadows. That's because the, the bits that aren't meadows are the hills where they had the arable crops. And in between are the damp areas with small burns as well. And that's where the meadows were. But meadows were also close to buildings. That's not because they stored the hay in buildings. Hay was quite a rare thing in Scotland until the, until the 19th century. Um, they stored, the, the meadows were close to buildings because that's where the animals spent the winter inside the buildings. The average numbers of meadows on this particular example per farm was about one and a half. The largest meadow in this example was a whopping 77 acres, which is a massive size for a meadow. But the smallest meadow was just half an acre. And the average size was 16 acres. And if you take away the massive ones, it comes down to less than 10 acres per farm. And the average proportion in this example of meadows per farm was 4.35%. And if you look at all the whole estate, that was about 3%. So in summary, meadows were widespread and common on virtually all farms, but minor in extent at the farm scale. Now, there have been studies done in England which have produced almost exactly the same result. There have been a few studies done in the Highlands, which again have resulted in a fairly similar result. I'm not aware of any studies like this that have been done before in the south of Scotland. So we're, we're breaking new ground here. But we're coming up with results that are pretty much the same as just about everywhere else. What has happened to the meadows since then? Well, again, there's an English and Welsh study 
which has found that 97% of these medals have been lost. So I thought it'd be interesting to have a look at the Austin estate and see what's happened to their medals that were on those maps that I showed earlier. So for that northern section again, 21 farms. Some are, have now been converted or allowed to degrade into rush pasture. Some have been planted up with coniferous forestry and some have scrubbed over with mostly willow scrub. So in total, the number of area of meadows surviving on the Earlston estate today compared to what it was, is none at all. They're all gone. And again, that, that is not dissimilar to what's happened in the rest of the UK. But in terms of ecology, what are the meadows used to consist of? We don't really know because, as Nick said, I work for an organisation which stores biological records. But the earliest biological record that we have that includes information about the species, about the precise location and about the date and also about the person who recorded it is 1840. So it's, it's after these maps. So all we can do is have a guess at what the ecology was um, at, in about 1800. And I could show you lots of plants and speculate lots of information about them, but we haven't got time to do that. So I'll just pick four out almost at random. Um, on the left hand side is pig nut, which is actually a woodland plant. But as I said at the beginning, meadows were created from woodland clearings. And you can still find pig nut, it's still quite a common plant, you can still find it in some grassy areas, but you can find it just as commonly in woodlands now. So it's almost reverted back to its original uh, habitat. The blue one at the top is devil's bit scabious. Again, I'll, I'll be guessing if, if I knew what the species was um, in the 18th century, where the species was in the 18th century, but um, you can go to these, what used to be meadows now, and find lots of devil's bit scabious. So it's maybe one of the plants that's actually done okay from the a loss of meadows. The yellow one is uh, globe flower, which is a, quite a rare species in Dumfries and Galloway now. Um, but you've really got to look for it along riversides. It, um, it's a very common species in meadows in the Pennines, but I've never, I've never seen it in meadows in Dumfries and Galloway, the few meadows we have left. It's, it's reverted more to a riverside species. And finally, the, uh, the one on the right hand side, the big one is um, Greta butterfly orchid. I like to think that Greta butterfly orchid would, would have been quite common in meadows, but I'm just guessing at that. It's very rare today. It does occur not too far away from where we are now in an area which is still called a meadow, but it's not managed as a meadow. Um, so that one potentially is a, is a big loser from these changes. And this one is an even bigger loser from those changes. This is a corn crake, despite the name corn, it, it might have occurred in the arable fields, but mostly would have occurred in the meadows. And corn crake was a common bird throughout the UK up until the 20th century. And then with the loss of these meadows, it started declining and declining. Um, so that by about 1940s, it was just about extinct in, in England and was just about extinct in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, hung on in the Western Isles and a few places that still have meadows. But a lot of the rest of the UK, it's now virtually completely disappeared as a breeding bird. So surviving meadows in Galloway, Scotland and across the UK, just to summarise, are now very rare compared to what they used to be. The ones that do survive tend to be designated for conservation interest. And quite a lot of them are actually owned and or managed by conservation organisations. But crucially, not all of them are managed as meadows. Some of them still have meadow in the name, but hay crops are, are not taken from them as frequently as they once would have been. So that's all pretty bad news. But the good news is meadows can be created. 
uh, relatively easily. I say relatively, it might take you a few decades to, to get a good meadow back, but that's a lot quicker than what we're going to hear about for some of the other habitats later on. And uh, I've seen some fantastic meadows that have been created in gardens. Uh, and you could create them in your own gardens if you so wanted to. You could even take a hay crop off it. So summarising, I think we've probably, I think I've probably come up to the end of my time. Summarising, meadows have had a 2,000 year history in Britain and yet today they're almost extinct. But there is hope they could be recreated. Um, so I did a bit of a similar study looking at um, old maps and looking at where moths used to be and things. Um, so there's roughly 2,500 species of moths in the UK and 1,300 of those are in Scotland alone and 550 of those species are macro moths which is mainly what I'll be talking about today because I don't know that much about my, uh, micro moths. Um, but, um, moths are habitat specialists um, and tend to adapt around the habitat they live in rather than like moving depending on um, things. <laughs> um, the um, environment has changed a lot in the last 200 years, uh, especially at Ilston Estate um, due to uh, anthropomorphic changes and uh, natural processes. Um, there's been losses of habitats as um, Peter said and they've gained new habitats. Um, so these are some of the maps taken from the um, Gremlin project. On the left hand side is the 200 year old maps of Elston Estate and on the um, right hand side are the current maps and the habitats that are there. So you can see this sort of like um, a lot of meadows and pasture on the left hand side where um, they used to be and now it's been taken over by a lot of conifer and acid grassland. Um, and so it's the same again here there's been a lot of um a lot of uh, there used to be like pastures and, and meadows and um 200 years ago and now it's acid grassland and uh forestry with a bit of uh, heathland which is the pink um and these are some of the moss that would have lived there so um going from left to right um there's a fox moth um the uh, narrow broad bordered bee hawk moth, um, the um, Brighton wainscot moth, and the forester moth. These all would have lived in uh, meadows. Uh, the Brighton wainscot moth is now extinct and has been for the last, I think, 50 years ish, um, and that's due to the loss of habitat. And um, forester moths are becoming extinct. There uh, is only a few pockets of populations and that they're also becoming extinct because of the lack of uh, larval food plants. Um, fox moths you can still see today, they've uh, shifted habitat and uh, they're now found more in like coastal grassland areas. Um, the cinnabar moth is still found today and uh, their um, larval food plant is the uh, ragwort, which um, we can't say would have been in meadows but if, if, it were, if they were, they would have lived in meadows. Um, and they're quite a unique species that I thought I'd point out because they um, are quite brightly coloured. Everybody says moths are boring, uh, but they're not. And they're quite brightly coloured. And that's because they take the poison in ragwort that is, like people know, uh, ragwort's poisonous to um, a lot of agricultural uh, mammals like cows and things. Uh, but cinema moths actually take that poison and um, use it as like a predatory defence. And that's why they're so brightly coloured. Um, and these are a bunch of moths that would live in the new habitat. So these would live in uh, forestry places and things. Uh, so again, going from top to um, left to right, there's the uh, pine hawk moth, the pine lappet moth, a uh, white spotted pinion, the drinker moth and a buff arches. And um, they all would live in the new habitat, which is acid grassland and forestry. Um, the, um, this is a, a more forestry adapted species that would live on um, the woodlands that have replaced the meadows and grasslands and they've adapted to look like broken twigs. So I thought they'd be a cool species to mention because they look pretty cool. Thank you.
can start off with a question, uh, firstly to Peter, um, coming from Dr. Anna and Larry Griffin, who I believe you both know. Yeah. It says, how on earth do you know that weirdly shaped meadow, uh, shape is a meadow? Um, because it was marked as meadow on the mark. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually, that is the answer, uh, uh, Larry and Anna. The, the old maps did mark them as meadows and all that the National Library Service of Scotland has done is believe what the old map writers said. Now, if they were lying, we're in trouble. Um, we, we believe, uh, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but they were generally pretty accurate because it's in their interest to be accurate because they were, they were creating a plan for a farm. So they knew they need to know how much area there was for forage, et cetera, et cetera. So we know it's a meadow because someone told us it was a meadow in 1790. Okay, uh, any questions from the, the wider audience? Mr. Ansel. Peter, um, can you restore a meadow? We, we've got a, a moribund meadow. It's actually, the, it's called the Mida. Yeah. Um, but uh, obviously nobody's out there scything it every year. Yeah. Can you effectively restore that by annual topping um, of the, the grasses? And if so, would you need to remove the, the cut grass to, to reduce the fertility? I'm trying to think of an easy way of doing this. Yeah, uh, the answer is there isn't an easy way of doing it. But the positive answer is yes, you can restore it. But you've already worked out what you need to do is to uh, reduce the nutrient levels um, because if there's high nutrient levels then the grass outcompetes the flowers so what you've got to do is um, every year grow a hay crop and then remove the hay crop somewhere else inside a cow or <laughs> somewhere off the land so that that nutrient isn't going back into the soil now it depends how long it hasn't been a meadow for because if it hasn't been a meadow for decades you'll have had decades of grass growing and falling and the nutrients going into the soil and you might find that the soil is highly nutrient enriched which means that you're going to take a long long time to actually reduce that level again so the positive news is it can be done and it's not rocket science in terms of doing it, but it does take a while. Okay, I have a question here from Divine Wellwater, and she's asking the question about meadows and the species that live on meadows. If meadows were uh, an anthropogenic device, uh -huh. um, 2000 years old or so, um, and we've now lost them, what would have uh, what was the precursor of meadows so all these species what created the meadows before humans created the meadows yeah uh, it's an interesting question and there isn't an easy answer to it because ecologists have been discussing that exact question for the last 10 or 20 years um the ecologist who's probably contributed most to the discussion is a dutch ecologist called franz vere and his theory is that um, the, woodland, the natural vegetation of Northern Europe would have been woodland, but woodland would have grown up and then large herbivores would have pushed the trees over and um, created clearings, which the meadow species would have got a chance to colonize. Um, and then over time, those clearings would um, colonize again with woodland. So as a continual changeover of clearings and woodland moving around the whole of northern europe is his theory but what's peter norman's theory and also what's your theory <laughs> <laughs> uh, i to a large extent go a long way with uh, what franz Vera has suggested um but there are other ecologists who've suggested that um it maybe wouldn't have happened like that and the, the meadow species would have been restricted to Places like riversides, where the rivers would have prevented the trees from, from getting going. So the short answer, Nick, is that we don't know the answer, but it's an interesting question. So I suppose, uh, Alex, and I'd an add on to that is if, uh, if the meadows are an anthropogenic device created for producing, are there moth species which have really benefited uh, from the activities of humans and are continuing to benefit? 
Uh, well, moss that feed on tree sap will benefit from all the forestry, like the pine specific species will benefit from all the new forestry plantations that keep going. So we've but moved, we've moved the species list along by with our activity yet again. Yeah. Yeah. So we've always lived as a landscape created by man. Now we have another question from the audience there. And McNabb is just going to run around, trot around quite quickly, please, McNabb. Yeah, hi. I'm just wondering, is, is there a definition of a meadow? And I'm asking because when I moved up here, got the house that I'm now living in, it was grass, which we left. And looking at it now, it's got lots of the meadow species that you were saying and, and more. So it has the pig nut. Um, and you know other ones, the meadow sweet and various other things. Is that a meadow or is that just an unkept grass? <laughs> it depends entirely on your, your definition, uh, because as I said, you can buy lots of books now which talk about how to create a wildflower meadow, and they don't necessarily talk about cutting it. But the original meaning of the meadow. You couldn't have a meadow unless you cut it. The, the actual wildflowers that grew in the original meadows were just a byproduct. That's, that's not the reason they did it. They did it to feed the livestock. The fact that there was wildlife in there was just, a, as I say, an accidental byproduct of, of what, the way they were managing the land. So, what you've got now, if you want to call it a meadow, you can call it a meadow. Um, <laughs> um, I suppose the cutting of the meadow creates a niche where lots of annual species can, yeah. can grow. Whereas if you leave a meadow, a, a grassland for a long time, the perennial species can come in and they'll maybe, maybe dominate. Would that yeah. be a, diff, a, a key difference? Yeah, you're exactly right, Nick. Um, and the other thing about a meadow is that they're not necessarily the best places for insects. Um, I mean, Alex has mentioned some of the moths that you do get in them, and you undoubtedly do get lots of moths in meadows but the thing about mowing a meadow is you do it in one day or a few days so you actually remove the entire habitat in one go which is which is not always great for a lot of the specialist species i just want to add what i what what's happened where i live i think is absolutely fantastic we've got a lot of knapweed in the so-called meadow um, and it's just been so we, we don't cut anything until very late uh, but i just want to say it's amazing because you walk out into it um, and you see all the butterflies lift off into the air and we've got lots of species of butterflies there but also now what's happened is we've got the goldfinches and other finches coming in to eat the seeds so it's it's just a wondrous thing to have just kind of following on from what you were saying about people creating meadows yeah. in their own gardens. Well, it's, you're a great example of what other people could do. So, yeah. Okay, um, I think if we give a round of applause to the first two speakers, if you two would like to go and swap your microphones over. I suppose uh, what's just been said there about the, 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 the meadows being man-made, actually we're actually talking about lots of habitat niches. So to have, to have good biodiversity across the landscape, you need a, a diversity of habitats as well. So. A meadow, we all think of a meadow being beautiful, but I think Peter's right there, it's a very harsh environment for many species, which is why the annual flowers do really well in there, because they're designed, if you like, to, to, to grow fast, have sex really quickly, then die. And they've got their seeds are left in the ground, whereas the perennial plants, it takes a lot longer, and if the man to mow a meadow comes along, they're not going to survive. So, we have two more speakers coming up, they would like to come forward. Uh, we have... Um, Emily Taylor from the Carbon Centre, Crichton Carbon Centre. Emily is the, the peat wizard of Dumfries and Galloway. She knows everything about peat and how to restore peat and, and how important peatlands are to, to, uh, to our ecology and to, for, for carbon sequestration, etc. And before her, we've got Archie McConnell, who everyone know, who is one of the founder members of Dumfriesshire Archival Mapping product, product Project, the product of which is tonight's event. And, it was uh, Archie's idea, along with co-conspirators in the National Library Service, to create this gremlin idea where we pulled all the, the different uh, habitat types up. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Archie, who will then hand over to Emily. Um. Uh, right, uh, just so that you know, a gremlin stands for 
the Glen, Clen, Glen Ken's Rectified Estate uh, Mapping Landscape Information Network. <laughs> Do have a uh, look at it online uh, under the National Library of Scotland's um, website. Uh, I am, in fact, uh, here under false pretenses, as I am neither an ecologist uh, nor, I'm afraid to say, a time traveller. Um, when uh, Johannes Blau, the great Dutch cartographer, completed his Atlas of the World in 1640s, he said that he had done it so that people could contemplate the furthest reaches of the globe from the comfort of their own homes. Similarly, one of the objectives of DAMP is to allow people to contemplate their past surroundings from the comfort of their own century. Old maps are the nearest thing that we have to time travel. So, how does the dynamic between humans and the landscape currently work? If ecology is a branch of science concerned with the interrelationship of organisms and their environments, how do we go about understanding that vast impact that we have on our environment? Uh, it is at moments like these that I turned to one uh, Terry Pratchett. I hope you will read him. It wasn't a city, it was a process, a weight on the world that distorted the land for hundreds of miles around. People who had never seen it, um, see it in their whole lives, nevertheless spent their life working for it. Thousands and thousands of green acres were part of it. Forests were part of it. It drew in and consumed and gave back the dung from its pens and the soot from its chimneys and the steel and saucepans and all the tools by which its food was made and also clothes and fashions and ideas and interesting vices, songs and knowledge and something which, if looked at in the right light, was called civilization. That's what civilization meant. It meant the city. We are all, especially foresters and farmers, merely a, a part of that larger organism. So what kind of a country do we have and what kind of a country do we want? Uh, Pratchett again. Where there is suitable country for grain, people farm. They know the taste of good soil. They grow grain. Where there is good steel country, Furnaces turn the sky to sunset red all night. The hammers never stop and people make steel. There is coal country and beef country and grass country. The whole world is full of countries. Uh, where one thing shapes the land and the people and it all feeds the city. One type of country can also change from uh, into another type of country, very much dependent upon the whim of the city. Uh, this used to be cattle country around here, and then it was mainly sheep country by the time the gremlin maps were made, and now it's becoming timber country. We see this changing pattern most easily when we view timber and how the demand is built over time and how we change our production to suit a particular marketplace. Keep all this in mind as we look at the maps. On the Gremlin maps, there are three distinct zones. Um, the first zone, uh, there are no trees. The second zone is the woodland around Ulston and Barskirch. We'll go into these in more detail in a minute. And indeed, at the bottom of the northern block of land, uh, these are matched by the neighbor's woodland in the Garach Glen, Knocknarling, and in the north at Glenhowl and Dunduch. The background map is the 1920s, and so uh, before the Forestry Commission planting and also before the dams were built. The third zone is the one around the home of Bar McClellan and is very different in its looks with the groups of small woodlands. Uh, this zone shows no trees at all, which I find interesting as well. Um, but it shows us the black ca uh, blank canvas uh, uh, as it was in the 18th century as planting systems properly developed. But it stayed sheep country for some time to come. It is often assumed that sheep are to blame for no trees. 
uh, it is not just this. In his dictionary, MacTaggart writes in 1824, Muirburn, the way they have in the moorlands of burning down old heather so that the grass may arise to feed cattle and sheep. The work of the Muirburn goes on in the dry weather of spring and blazes away with rapid wildness, frightening hares and grouse from its neighborhood. When the viewed from the lowlands on a fine night, it makes one fancy of the devastations of war spreading quickly when lighted and encircling the wild mountains in red curving flames. Moving on to the second zone, these woodlands centered around Earlston were very much commercially oriented. They sold to the Lead Hills Mines in seven, uh, 1670s and get a mention in 1684 as a supplier of timber all down the Ken Valley. In 1801, planning for the Glen Kens Canal included timber as one of the commodities, the commodities that needed transport. There is a reflection of the commercial nature of the woodland in the name given to a wood on waterside, which is hag wood. A hag in this instance is a coppice division. The area would be divided into several hags and you would uh, harvest one um, each year or in rotation anyway. The woodland on the home of Bar McClellan uh, maps is very different and consists not of largish blocks but of much smaller units on the tops of drumlins. The woods in the north are older, the ones that we'd looked at before, while the Bal McClellan ones here are much more 18th century. It looks like they were created for sporting reasons. John Spaulding was the estate owner and definitely a sporting man. He fought a duel with pistols against his neighbor at Ken Muir Shooting was obviously in the blood. Okay, tree species. Um, species are not shown on the gremlin maps, but are on earlier versions such as this. It shows the difference between broadleaf trees and Scots pine, or fir as it is known then. See the area named Fir Park. In 1793, the first statistical account mentions plantations of firs, some of which are old and stately. And this is the fir park that it's being referred to over here. How old this is, we do not exactly know, but we can hazard a guess at these trees being planted up to uh, 90 or 100 years previous to the uh, quotation. Uh, note the single large tree on the map uh, next door to the house. You can see it best in the little vignette at the, on the right-hand side. Uh, that is the Earlston oak. Although there would have been a good mix of trees, elm and ash particularly, in these woodlands, the main crop appears to have been oak. The large Earlston oak is a testament to the aged nature of these woodlands. The castle dates from the middle of the 16th century. Oak woodland can often be found next to door to tower houses, and it's likely that their siting was also predicated on the supply of this timber. So these woodlands with oak in them stretch back several hundred years. Similar situations occur at similar big houses in the area with the likes of Kenmuir, Bascobe, Shermers, and Dunduch, all have oak woodland close by. The process that is the city has very much reached here uh, at this time, as sheep and cattle are traded over land while oak and ash and pine are being traded down the river towards Kokubri. Um, although this woodland is old, it has been modified by the use of seed from a wide variety of places. In Scotland, the first reference to a tree nursery was in 1460. But well before that, the monastic networks supplied seed and trees from abroad. And so even before the 17th century, genetic purity had been well muddled. The gardener in those days was also the forester. 
And here on this map are the gardener's house and gardener's farm, if you can pick them out. The um, farm on the left-hand side and his house over on the right. Um, this is evidence of proper forestry. We would have been, um, uh, he would have been a part of that network of tree seed and seedling buying from both uh, the UK and Europe. Uh, we know, for instance, that there were divergent opinions about the pine seed. Uh, for instance, whether it was uh, best coming from the highlands or from Scandinavia. It was uh, noticed in 1824 that the plantations were starting to bring in different species of birds. Uh, the chief of these was the crossbill pictured here. The then minister of Balmaclellan writes, plantations have increased in the neighborhood and there is this interesting stranger may be seen from time to time extracting seeds with his singular bill from the cones of the Scotch fir. Uh, he also refers to other birds that have increased. These include uh, the missile thrush and oddly the starling, which I would not regard particularly as woodland birds, but they would enjoy the trees to roost in. Um, governments understood the need for woodland creation. And looking at how things are changing, uh, from way back by the middle of the 18th century, uh, governments were encouraging uh, plantations through the use of import duties on foreign small roundwood and tan bark. These duties were removed when government moved to a free trade era in the 1850s. The result was virtually no new planting in the UK for around 60 to 70 years. The two maps show the situation in 1800 and again in 1920. What you can see is the decline of woodland uh, from the 1800 map. The Scots pine plantation that we were talking about, which is the block next door to the um, river on the, right -hand on the left hand map, um, is just not there on the right hand side. And similarly, the block higher up the hill on the far left has diminished considerably on the right-hand side. So we find that tree cover is, is um, going down the way. The Scots pine plantation, uh, the fir park on the earlier map, for instance, has now disappeared. The demand from cities has suddenly ceased because they were getting cheaper goods from elsewhere. And coming up to date, um, this is on the um, Gremlin site in the National Library. Um, you can see very clearly um, on the pie charts how the significant increase in woodland, and the, um, there would have been a similar story if the charts had dates that spanned, say, 1920 to 2015. Since 1919 and the foundation of the Forestry Commission, the marketplace has demanded pretty much monocultural forestry. In our area, the result is that around 80% of the new planting and replanting is only one species, and that, of course, is Sitka spruce. In another couple of years, I suspect that over 60% of the gremlin map will be covered in commercial cropping. Uh, it's fashionable to say that moorland is a desert as far as biodiversity is concerned, but it held an infinitely more interesting spectrum of life than the floor of a Sitka plantation. I suddenly discovered the other day uh, that we had rainforests in the west of Scotland uh, when my son sent me a book for my birthday recently. Um, I would give a definition of British rainforests, but the book did not indulge in clarity, I'm afraid. Most of the so-called rainforests were not the bits and pieces that were left by the sheep, but were commercial plantations from a previous era. For the most part, they are what we might like to call industrial relics. 
The woods that we praise now as biodiverse are often there because they were well utilized in the past. It's easy to love a lichen or a polypody fern when viewed as a choice compared to the bare branches and ground of a Sitka spruce plantation. There are woodlands and then there's this sort of thing. The problem here is not just the looks of the thing, but the use of a quick clear fell regime which suddenly changes blocks of trees followed by close planting designed to halt an undergrowth from competing with the crop. None of this encourages a lively biodiversity. Uh, there must, to me, be a better way of doing things. And the problem with uh, sudden transitions is that they bring sudden reactions. For example, uh, the weevil on the left of this picture, um, the weevil population explodes after a clear fell. This is not a problem in itself, but they can all but annihilate a newly planted crop of Sitka, requiring several heavy doses of insecticide as a standard practice. On the right is another destroyer, but this is much more interesting as it can simply wipe out the whole of the Sitka crop. It's the spruce bark beetle. It is present in the crops in the southwest of Scotland already. It is only one of the threats that face modern forestry and make it potentially less resilient. It is now timber country indeed. However, it's not a lot of smallholders who own it, but the land is now simply being carved up by corporations and pension funds who believe that they will make a quick buck or even a slightly slower one. We need timber right enough, but like this, what problems hit when we um, shall, uh, what problems hit when we shall see the money men run for cover, uh, sorry, when problems hit, the, uh, then we will see the money men run for cover. We shall be left with a desolate wilderness of Sitka spruce. Uh, what is it that we would like? How do we work with the land that we do have? Is this really what we mean by civilization? Um, I leave you with those questions. Okay, so I hope my presentation might be a useful follow on to that really kind of useful introduction actually to what I want to be talking about. Um, yeah, seamlessly. So it's been really interesting for me pulling together this presentation because I think I've realized that I probably am an ecologist and I think I am actually a time traveling one too. Um, so my presentation is really about understanding our PT past. So I'm going to be talking to you about peatlands and really thinking about then, well, how does that inform our future? And I actually realized that I work for the Crank Carbon Center, uh, myself and my colleagues were out restoring peatlands and we're looking to our past all the time to inform what we're going to do with our peatlands, how we're going to restore them. So actually it's part of our day to day work now looking, looking at the past. And it's been great to have a resource like Gremlin pull together some of that historic information and data. So it's made it actually a lot easy, easier for us to interpret. So we'll be using it um, quite a lot going forward. So peatlands, um, there's a great statistic about you're never that far away from a rat. I think we probably can come up with something similar about peatlands. You're never that far away from peatlands. In Scotland, we'd have around 2 million hectares of peatlands. It's a really significant part of our land resource. In the Galloway Glens area, of course, here, you see the map on the left, um, all those different coloured splodges are all different types of peatland. So a lot of our land use is underpinned by our peaty soils, our peaty soils and our, and our peatlands, whether they be called bogs or mosses or carbon rich soils, however you like to term them. Now, peatlands, of course, are very carbon rich, as we've already heard, um, and that's because they formed over thousands of years from organic matter. And this very handily eroding peat hag here um, shows you just that peat profile. And it can show you the depth of peat that can accumulate. And we've been forming peatlands really for about 10,000 years now, since the last ice age. 
um, as the glaciers retreated, left behind little glacial lakes that slowly became wetlands, infilled over time and grew its organic matter. Um, peatlands, of course, very wet, very acidic, so this organic matter doesn't decay fully, hence why we get this buildup of peat. And really our peatlands started forming uh, mostly kind of lowland areas originally, but then later on, about kind of 6,000 years ago, really, we start to see the blanket bogs forming across the vast kind of extent of Scotland here. So we, when we talk about history, we're talking thousands of years in history. Um, but again, really important for us to understand uh, where that peat formation has occurred and why it's occurred. Now, to be a time traveling ecologist, you've got to be pretty young, fit and strong. So this is two of my colleagues, Lewis and Anna, and they are taking a peat core. And this is actually a Russian core bought by the Gallery Glen scheme years and years ago, right when the very kind of first few months of the scheme. And we've used that core ever since to actually go right down deep into our peat profile and pull out these core sections. As you can see, lots of strength required. Um, and you can actually see the peat. So not only do you understand the depth of peat that you're standing on, but you can see what it's composed of as well. And that's really very useful. We don't often do lots and lots of fancy scientific analysis, but we look at the texture of the peat particularly, and we're realizing that some peats are just more crumbly in nature because of the kind of species that have grown that peat, if you like, and actually we're finding they're more prone to erosion going forward. So sometimes we take peat cores and we go, oh, this is a very odd texture peat. This might be a priority to look at doing restoration. So again, we're looking at a deep history there to inform what we want to do. Um, and that's really important for us because we're faced with landscapes like this, of course. This is the Clattering Shaws area here that we all know very well. And this is the current land use. This is the current landscape. This is the current ecology. But it didn't used to be like this. So when we take a peat core, even we just take a peat depth, it really illustrates that actually this was once an active forming peat bog. We've heard about all the different transitions through habitats we've seen over time. And what it helps us do, it helps us reimagine you know, what these places could be and what they should be as well. What's really fascinating is just when you take a peak core, you suddenly realize the history in which you're standing upon. Now this kind of smudgy line at the top here, this is actually a huge long bit of wallpaper that we've rolled out and we've laid a peak core on the top of. So that big smudgy line is the trace, it's the ghost imprint of a peak core. And just to highlight some dates for you here, so right at the very bottom there, about four and a half thousand years ago, we've got the Bronze Age going on. Okay, this is the time where we're seeing kind of big woodland clearances. About 2,000 years ago, that's when we see the Eurasian elk die out. The Romans invade. That's all in our peak core. What's even more interesting, you look at the really recent history. 1972, in the very top of our peak core, Castle Douglas was formed. And then the railway came. But more importantly, 1950, the TV came to Cross Michael. Okay, this is the history below our feet when we were taking a peat core. And this was an event we did, an archaeology event, where we laid this core out and people could put in the dates and times that are important to them. So we had a lot of very interesting ones come in at the top there. And what's really interesting, when you look at kind of historical maps, historical spatial data on peatlands, you start to see where they once were. Um, and they could be called mosses, they could be called bogs. Even today, we can be out doing a peat condition survey and we'll be looking across the horizon and we go, oh, look at that peat erosion over there in that hill. Quick, where is that? And we get the big OS map and we look, oh, it's called Haggy Hill or it's called Brown Bog or it's called Blood Moss. You know, so this historical information that we have held in our map archive is really important to us today. Now, this is just a little glimpse of a, a moss that was highlighted in the Gremlin project. So this green polygon here highlights an area that was described as moss. Now we can look at that here on the right hand side. This is a current aerial image. And it's really interesting because you look at that going, okay, yep, yeah, to me it looks kind of peaty, boggy, but look, there's woodland coming in there. You've now got a road on that hand, right hand side. Has that affected the hydrology? You look at that very kind of harsh left edge of probably a field edge. Is there a drain in there? So we're always looking at how have these peatlands been kind of cut up over time? How have they been modified? Because that's really important for us to understand if we're to go forward and look at kind of re restoring these areas. Um, also, it's really, sometimes it's not about the physical changes that you see in terms of drains or areas that have been cut, but actually what's happened on the surface. Um, I love fence lines, and this is one of my favorite fence line pictures. So this is the difference between sheep, no sheep. 
Okay, so the grazing density has really changed just the vegetation that's growing on top of your peatland. So we're always looking for that information too. Now, this is kind of honing in on an area that we know particularly well at the Carbon Centre called the Moss of Cree. Now, the Moss of Cree is not in the kind of Gremlin area, but it's out near, just between sort of Newton Stewart and Wigton on the Cree estuary. And this is an area where we spent a lot of time looking at doing restoration, serving the area and getting to understand its his, kind of historical use over time. Um, and it's a fascinating area, really important lowland raised bog. You know, we're talking about 250 hectares of lowland raised bog, really important habitat. If this was probably south of the border, this area would have been designated. But here we have a lot of this stuff around here. So this is kind of kind of fallen through the cracks, so to speak. And this is an old aerial image taken after the Second World War. And as we've seen already, the huge shift towards kind of afforestation, commercial forestry, is seeing this open area become covered in trees. And what's really interesting, although this is one big peat unit, and you can kind of tell there's that sort of almost circular splodge in the middle, but to the left of it, that's still the same peat area, that's still the same lowland raised bog. But already you see, even pre-forestry, the areas have been cut up into different ways and probably used quite differently. Um, hopefully you'll be able to see there's a very faint line running right through that kind of circular area, and that's a drain. Okay, so these are the kind of things that we actually see in our sleep now. We map so many of these drainage features on aerial images. But again, really important information. Okay, the hydrology is quite heavily modified here. You look to that very weird straight edge at the bottom of that kind of circular blobby bit. That's a cut edge. Okay, so that area has actually been cut. Peat has been extracted and probably used on the farm's fire for heat as a fuel. Okay, so all these clues start emerging. Um, of course, big shift in land use, big modification, try and get trees growing. Hats off to the folk that drained these areas and ploughed these areas to try and get trees to grow, because they were putting machines in, in like this. This is actually a picture of Moss of Cree um, while it's getting ploughed up. And there's a series of images here you can actually find online. And the next image of, is of that plough sunk. OK, this is a deep bog, about eight metres of peat in places. So they really tried and we got really good at draining, draining our peatlands. And because we wanted to convert it into forestry for lots of different reasons. And so for a long time, Moss of Cree had a pretty poor crop of forestry growing on it, particularly that splodgy bit that we saw in the aerial image. Um, so that's been the area that we've really looked at doing restoration on. So uh, about 20 years ago, not quite 20 years, but Forestry Land Scotland, who at the time owned and managed that ground, um, actually took all the trees off. So we suddenly have this open part of the Moss of Cree. The rest of that conifer crop you see on the left-hand side, that's actually still standing, which is interesting to us and difficult for us because we want to restore the hydrology of this area, but you've got an active work in forestry right on its boundary. So the hydrology is all different, it's all modified. So we have to account for that in our restoration plans. Um, so the open area, yeah, great, timber's off, brilliant, but it's still not a bog. It was still way too dry. It was still very heavily drained really deeply ploughed. So what did we have? We had lots of ridges and furrows. And along these very dry ridges, we just got loads of regen coming back. So it wasn't bog, it wasn't good bog habitat. So we looked at all of this information, the kind of pre forestry aerial imagery. We looked at the data from when that area kind of was a standing crop of trees. Uh, we understood the drainage, the contemporary drainage, but also the more historical drainage as well. And we came up with a restoration plan. And we worked with the landowner um, for the, about five, six years now, and he undertook three years worth of restoration. So this whole area is now has seen restoration. Um, so this involved diggers on the ground, low ground pressure excavators. It's a uh, pretty dramatic stuff. This is kind of what it looks like once we've done the restoration. This is the open area here. Um, and we've basically flattened the site out. We've broken up all the drains. We've buried all that regen into the bog. And this is what you're left with. Pretty terrifying. Two weeks ago, we were out there doing a bio blitz. And this is what the site now looks like. Okay, it's amazing. So think what this Moss of Cree has been through. It's formed over 10,000 10, years. The climate's done all sorts of different things. It would have been wet woodland. It would have been heather dominated. It would have been grass dominated. And then we came along, drained it, plowed it, probably tried to plant potatoes in it. Then, okay, cut it for domestic fuel. And then, oh, forestry crop on it. Took that off, left it. Okay, what do we do with it? Get machines back on flatten out, bare peat, and now look at it here. So the recent history of these sites are fascinating. And I think what's 
really exciting about this site is you see what's possible. And you know, just because our landscape looks like it does now doesn't mean to say that's what it always has to look like. So understanding our past is really important to inform kind of currently what we're doing in terms of our restoration, but also understanding kind of more of our kind of recent ecological past, if you like, is also really important. Does anyone recognize this site here? Silver flow, yeah, it's in incredibly dry conditions here, actually. Um, but these white posts that you can see here, these kind of mark out various things that we're monitoring out there. Say we, the collective we, lots of research has been happening at Silver Flow. But we've also been taking sort of hydrological information, measuring the height of the water table within the peat itself. And that's really interesting for us because, of course, now we're going into a phase of climate change. Like, you know, vast, fast, rapid climate change. So understanding our past kind of hydrological conditions is really important to understand. Um, how these bogs might respond to kind of future climate changes. But I'm afraid it's also kind of, well, what's next? There's probably a lot of areas in Scotland and the UK where we probably can't see peat formation going forward because our climate's going to get too dry, too extreme. So we expect the range of where we can see active peat formation to actually constrict. Um, but that's not to say it's not important to still restore these peatland areas because we need to hold on to that carbon keep it locked away, make sure it doesn't reach the atmosphere. It's also really useful in, in quite kind of quick and rapid ways as well. So it's not just about long term trends. It's also about understanding maybe aerial images from 10 years ago to try and assess how things have changed in that time. And what we're starting to pick up is the rate of erosion, particularly in the east of our region, is accelerating. So this is the same site, probably about three years apart. And we see that's a new phase of erosion. And that's because we're getting very dry, prolonged droughts, kind of spring, summertime, and then they get these really intense rainfall events um, in the summer, August, particularly wet months now. And we're seeing this kind of erosion happen. So this helps us at the Carbon Centre go, right, this is an area we need to prioritise now for restoration. So we're using really old data. We're really using kind of recent data. We're using some fantastic old maps, you know, that have been colored by hand, and now we're using, you know, satellite imagery, satellite data as well. We're using the whole lot to inform kind of what we're doing with our peatlands. Um, and I think what's really fascinating is, is just this idea that things can change and we can make a change. So just like Kerry's meadow, um, I would say it's more than just a left bit of grass. It's a meadow, it sounds amazing. Things can change and things can change really quite quickly. This is a site in the Glen Kens called South Dee. And this is a forestry and land Scotland site, just kind of uh, Craig and Callie is just on the left there, if you know, and the Clarton Shores is to your right. This is just off the kind of public road here. Looking down on this clear fell area, it's pretty deep peat in here. So it's earmarked for restoration. Um, so they came on, took as much brash timber off as possible, went in, um, did a technique called ground smoothing, and literally two growing seasons later, it looked like this. Okay, this is the right bog species coming back that quickly because we've sorted out the hydrology. You know, I'll need long-term maintenance, it'll be a slow transition, but it just shows you bogs want to be bogs. And if you get the conditions right, you can see quite rapid change as well. So it gives us hope that we can kind of move things around. And so we don't need to be quite so hung up on what the current situation is. We can look at the soils, we can look at the hydrology, we can understand, well, what was it? How did it form? How could we tweak the conditions to get this kind of ecosystem back and happening again? So I think it's really important, and the kind of note I want to end on is, yeah, it's fascinating looking back at our, in our timeline, our history, particularly from a climate point of view. You know, our bogs have been around a long time. They've coped with a lot of climate change, but really the future is kind of up to us. So it's about understanding what do we want to do where and why, what for. So things like understanding biodiversity. You know, we could probably have more biodiverse areas if we knock some of these Sitka spruce blocks back and open it back out to rough ground, even if it's not perfect bog habitat, just having these areas of rough ground, if you can connect them up down riparian zones, for example, you know, suddenly you've got a different habitat, you've got more diversity in your landscape. And I would say this is all kind of down to us. OK, what happens next? It's all in our hands. And I think what's been amazing about the Gallery Glen scheme is the fact we've really brought people into the conversation. So this is just some images of some of the work that we've done through some of our Gallery Glen funded projects. 
And really, it's a case of getting everybody involved in thinking about kind of reimagining what we want to do and understanding the kind of drivers for that as well, which conventionally have been about timber production, um, economics. More and more, you'll hear the phrase natural capital or biodiversity crisis, by the way. We're also in a biodiversity crisis, not just a climate crisis. So we're starting to see a change in emphasis and a change in drivers from our land owning community as well. And so I think, you know, the future is really interesting. The more of this we can do, I think the better, the more discussions we can have and the more kind of points of view that we hear, I think we'll probably end up with hopefully a more resilient uh, landscape kind of based on the founding blocks of our land, our water, our soils. So on that note, I just want to say a massive thank you because Gallery Glens has really helped us begin this journey, bring people into the conversation and think a bit beyond what we have currently and kind of reimagining what we can do. So a huge thank you to, to Gallery Glens and everybody who has supported our work to date. And I've said, watch this space because this is not the past, okay? There's a big future to come as well. So please keep in touch with the Carbon Centre and this area as well, even after Gallery Glens, because I think there'll be lots of cool stuff happening going forward. But great, thank you very much. I'll let you do your thank you very much, uh, as ever. Emily and Archie, that was, that was brilliant. Um, I particularly liked uh, Archie's reference to one of my favourite authors. Um, <laughs> um, one of my favourite bits in that is from a Mr. Word who starts a printing press. His dad's a bit demonic, but one of those money men who comes and digs up landscape. And Mr. Word starts a printing press, but he's very focused about getting the news out that's accurate. The problem is, accurate news sometimes takes a bit of time. And his father pointed out to him that uh, the, a lie travels around the world before the boot. The, a lie travels around the world before the truth's even got its shoes on. Uh, and that's a problem we have sometimes when we're, we're, we're trying to sort of work out what's going on. It takes time to understand all of this. Um, any questions first? Um, McNabb is going to pick up the microphone. He's been instructed by our director to run swiftly around the room now, <laughs> prancing <laughs> like a gazelle, uh, to the first question here. Prancing. Right. It was about the restoration of the uh, mosses, the bogs. Mm -hmm. Are you reseeding or is that natural? And if what plants are ideal for yeah. regeneration? Really good question. So we found around here, we don't need to seed anything. So we just need to get the conditions back. So that might be the hydrology. So keep the place wetter for longer through the seasons and stabilize it as well. So where you've got bare eroding peat, if you hold that all in place, get it to stabilize, keep it wet, then you'll get things coming through. And usually the first things you'll see coming through are things like cotton grasses. Um, but also we've been amazed just how quick sphagnum is to come back as well, because sphagnum's amazing and that can just regenerate from tiny fragments in the peat and really quite old bits of frag um, sphagnum as well. So yeah, we, we kind of find get the conditions right and things will come back. But that's because we have quite a viable seed bank in our peatlands. So elsewhere, particularly think in the north of England, they've had to do a lot of work introducing um, vegetation in. So again, kind of growing plug plants of cotton grasses. But here we're, we're very lucky and yeah, get it stabilising, wet and yeah, away it comes. Okay, any more questions from the audience? We've got a question at the front here whilst McNabb's trotting around to see him. I'll take one from the, the, um, the online audience. So it's a question here, presentation to both you and Emily. It's from Chris Fleet. Uh, thank you so much, they said. Uh, do you think that the estate map surveyors may, will have underestimated the extent of the peatlands, partly because they and the landowners who employ them were not keen to show peat moorland, and partly because peat was not always easy to distinguish from other land uses Ooh, like pasture? Good question. I think <laughs> what's interesting, and something I didn't mention, is the Moss of Cree was actually mapped about a hundred years ago now because peat was actually a really important resource. We used to dig up a lot of peat and ship it to our cities and it was used for horse bedding, for example. So actually peat was a valuable commodity as a fuel, as a kind of substance in itself. Um, so I think it might depend on the time, but I think some people were very interested to see where the peat was. But also peat is a soil. It's not just what's on the surface. 
-hmm. So it might depend on how the, the mappers were looking at things. They might just go, oh, that's a woodland, but it could be a woodland growing on six metres of peat. So it depends if they had peat probes or not, I guess. So I guess actually it would depend on the purpose of the map sometimes mm. of this, because a map, we think of it as being deadly accurate, but sometimes there'd be a motive for understanding how we best to value the estate. Uh, yes, to a certain extent. Um, it, it, not so much in terms of valuation, because there's still, um, from a, a cow and a sheep's point of view, they're still eating on a bog, um, which uh, is important to remember. Um, but one of the things that you do get the feeling on the gremlin maps is that the, the lines on the edges of the mosses are rather too swoopy, um, if you see what I mean. They're nicely curved, and quite frankly, I don't think that bogs are quite like that. They're just like everything else, they're a bit more wriggly and wiggly. And so I, it, they do get the feel of, of being uh, not necessarily accurate or inaccurate, but just being um, uh, pencil drawn from the side of the hill, shall we say. Florid pen strokes. Ex florid pen strokes. But they, and I don't think that, in some instances, there certainly is accuracy involved. And I think one of the bits that you showed just now, I think that there was certainly a hard edge on the edge of that bog. And that was where field began and bog began. So you can see that, but some of the other ones that are higher up in the hills, for instance, the bogs up there, sorry, the mosses up there, um, were, I, th I think, drawn from the side of the hill. They have that air anyway. Okay, we have a question from the audience here coming. Oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, How do you notice them here? <laughs> <laughs> a fascinating evening altogether. I've got moths and things flying around in my head now as well. Um, uh, but I wondered what your thoughts were on carbon capture. Um, I had a lot of people uh, nudging me recently about um, carbon credits and carbon capture. And uh, hearing Archie talking about forestry, it seems to me that that's already a bit passe and that uh, things are moving on now to people looking for large tracts of land to offset their carbon footprint. And that kind of also ties in with the, with the bog question. Uh, what, what's it going to be used for? Anyway, I'll let you take that. You've got a, you've got a <laughs> game at hand in this one. So you're absolutely right. So people are now looking at bogs through the carbon lens. And because we can put a number on the carbon, when we do restoration, we can go, you're saving X amount of carbon, then a value comes into that as well. So people are starting to see bogs as a more valuable resource than previously. Um, it's kind of been described as a Cinderella habitat for years, and now it's kind of coming into its own. Um, whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, kind of depends who it is, the ground, the whole kind of host of things, but it is potentially a mechanism to see much longer term, more sympathetic management of these areas for ultimately better ecosystem functionality. So it's important when we're doing peatland restoration and therefore saving more carbon is we're thinking about the system as a whole. We're trying to restore the, primarily the hydrological function of that area and what will be kind of will be. So I think, yes, it'll probably have good biodiversity benefits as well, although currently that's difficult to quantify, but we're already seeing, you know, anecdotal evidence around water availability, water reg regulation as well, um, by doing peatland restoration too. So I think people will start to see these areas as being fundamental to how landscape forms and kind of provides for us as well. So you can think about the hydro scheme here, for example, you know, it could be if we look at all the artificial drainage in our upper catchment, and start to think about that, we could maybe take out some of the huge flashiness we're now getting in our, our river systems. So yeah, a really good question, probably need another whole landscape partnership scheme to figure out the carbon question. But yeah, I think it, it could be really exciting to see how these areas suddenly are valued and therefore managed in different ways. Um, but yeah, with everything, you've got to be careful when there's a pound sign put against things. Thank you, Emily. And, um... 
On that, there will be another landscape partnership, hopefully, in the future, somewhere else, but watch this space. It's a few years away, but it's in development, it's in people's ideas. Um, I'm going to ask you a difficult question now for both of you. Um, I think it's a, a question that needs to be asked. It's from someone called Pat HB. I've no idea what the HB stands for. I used to do a, work, a lot of work with an invasive species called Himalayan balsam. And I used to always write HB after that, so maybe it's Pat Himalayan balsam. Uh, but Pat has asked actually a really important question. Very stimulating presentation to everyone. Thank you. Should all bogs currently carrying trees be restored? If so, where will we end up growing our timber? UK is the second biggest timber importer in the world, and global de demand for timber is forecast to increase by 50% in the next 10 years. Should we just exploit the developing world? I'll start with Archie, and then I'll move to Emily. Uh -huh. Right. Um, uh, uh, I know Pat. Hi, Pat. Um, <laughs> this is uh, it's, no, he's, he's not. He, <laughs> Hunter Blair. He's, from this neck of the woods, actually. Wow. And uh, I, just before we go on to that one, I, I would like to make uh, carry on with uh, response to Henry's comments um, on timber. If you're actually going to throw money at capturing carbon in, uh, in woodland, then the best way to do it is probably growing timber in Central America or West Africa. Number one, the land is cheaper. Number two, the trees grow about six times as fast as they do here. Um, and uh, number three is that they probably need it almost more than we do. Um, so I don't get the logic particularly of growing timber here. The problem is with forestry, to answer Pat's question, um, is that it, the way that it's constructed at the moment is it's not what we would term as being very resilient. Um, number one is the um, problem of uh, diseases and disease pressure. Um, uh, number two is the fact that that's amplified by the fact that most of the woodland is Sitka spruce. Um, and being a monoculture, anything would um, rip through it fairly fast. Um, number three is actually the nature of the marketplace. Uh, essentially, Sitka spruce goes to the lowest common denominator in, in the marketplace, uh, which means that uh, when things go pear-shaped, there isn't much place to go after that. And with Sitka spruce, it's not something that you can leave growing um, uh, out on the hill here because it'll all just blow over. And so it becomes essentially a useless crop. Um, so you can't wait for the marketplace to get better. So in terms of a, a, a resilient crop, it, it isn't. And I would reckon that, sorry, Pat, <laughs> um, you're fooling yourself if, it, if you are thinking that way. So uh, there's a lot to be done in terms of making that crop a lot more resilient. Um, and that includes um, making a wider variety of species in amongst it, um, but it probably includes things like um, uh, less planting on bogs and such like. Uh, I also understand that uh, we've got a trade deficit as far as timber is concerned, but um, uh, when you ha don't have enough timber, you use other things, um, is the way that the world has worked. Um, and it will carry on working that way. Um, uh, there are plenty of ways in which we can alter the marketplace, if you like, uh, which doesn't include timber. Um, and people have done that from time to time. Um, but yes, there is a deficit as far as our trade is concerned. Uh, but we have been buying from the Baltics and elsewhere for uh, very many years now, so it's, it isn't anything new. This is after that an experience I had with monoculture before I hand over to Emily. So many, many years ago, 
in a former life I used to help to manage a river over in the eastern region and um, I went to do a survey in a section which we you know normally got a very very high numbers of fish uh, salmon trout in, in the main and that year completely absent which kind of worried me first of all we checked does the equipment work it was all working we moved downstream absence of fish we moved downstream absence of fish we moved 10 kilometers downstream we started finding fish again we traced it back in the end to a treatment for pine weevils uh, a, 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 a synthetic peripheroid which is now banned except for in forestry where there was a derogation that lasted for a little bit longer which uh, was to treat the pine weevil the pine weevil was only a problem because the way that the forest was managed so you go in there you zap it all down and you create this super habitat for pine weevils so they grow in massive abundance I actually showed a, a slide of it you then go back and you plant a little sick spruce and one or two pine weevils is enough to kill an individual tree so they combat that by going and spot spraying uh, a, a very powerful insecticide on the trees with people who are trained but not very well remunerated and not necessarily always that well supervised and you don't need very much of this highly toxic chemical to cause a massive ecological disaster it was a similar chemical that was used in sheep dip and in events it was banned its license was withdrawn because even the government well, you see the government can make all sorts of mistakes but even the government couldn't keep the sheep dip on the sheep without getting into the river and they wiped out huge amounts of rivers with accidental spillage so that's the sort of consequences you have of creating monocultures you create monoculture pests as well mm. So that's, uh, that's one from me. Sorry about that, Emily. I, I thought I'd just hand over to you. So yeah, your answers. so I think my response to the original question there would be, well, what do you mean by timber? I think what are we actually growing on our bogs and where is it actually ending up? You know, is it pulp? Is it biomass? How much are we actually extracting from our bogs when we clear a fell? How much timber do we have to leave in the bogs so we can actually get the machines in to take the timber out? How economic is it? What is it we're actually getting from, you know, major hydrological impacts, water regulation impacts, biodiversity impacts, carbon impacts um, to grow quite a poor timber resource or wood fuel resource. So I think that's the question. And I think the question is growing in importance because we're now in a phase of seeing second rotations going on to deep peats. And, you know, should we make, be making that decision? So I think it's about really kind of understanding what it is we're producing where and what do we need going forward if it's building grade timber then don't plant your box okay any more questions from the audience oh definitely science well i think that ended slightly negatively but i think i'd like to turn it around to be actually <laughs> it's quite positive okay, just, we just before you do that um, i'd just like to say pat why don't you come down for your tea and we can discuss the matter <laughs> later on excellent <laughs> Uh, McNabb Laurie from the, the team leader for Galloway. If, if I could just ask Archie, which came first, the project Gremlin or the acronym Gremlin? Can I ask? <laughs> uh, the project actually did. I wanted to call it Project Water Lily, but that's a totally different <laughs> matter altogether. Yeah, I was going to say on a more yeah. positive note, what we have proved, I think, through some of the work that the Carbon Centre has done and other, all of our partners in the Galloway, there are solutions to some of these problems. Um, and it's really the willpower to get on and deliver those solutions. So it's not like turn the lights off and leave. There are things we can do. We can restore habitats. We can, uh, we can use Gremlin to look back and work out what's the capacity of the land to do these sort of things. And it's not about looking back and saying, we want everyone to be using a scythe to cut their meadows because uh, I don't think we'd have many takers on that but it's about looking at what was the land like and what sort of things could we have on, on in the future and we know everyone knows we have to have a more diverse form of usage across the landscape to have good biodiversity and the robustness that's created in biodiversity by having that uh, so we know how to get there and we're starting to now have those discussions we need to get on with it now but uh, I think we're going to close the, the meeting shortly. We have the other two presenters to come forward first. Um, this is the very last Galloway Glens hybrid event. These, these events started in the dark days of COVID, uh, where we had an idea 
to produce something that really was a diversion uh, from the news. If, if you all remember back in April 2020, and certainly my house and many other households here, News 24 was on all the time. The death numbers were going up. We thought the world was going to end. It was pretty dark, actually. Um, and I remember the team at Gallery Glens, we sat and we thought, can we do something which is a bit diversionary? And the reason we have Gremlin tonight is the very first presentation was from Archie and the, the Dumfrieshire Archival Mapping Projects. I thought I needed to get young go-getters, um, technologically proficient um, people sure. to, to get on and, and produce the very first <laughs> online experience. And we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, if I remember rightly, I actually got incredibly drunk um, because I thought we'd have a pub-like atmosphere and I'd drink a little bit of whiskey, but not very much. And by the end of the evening, I'd drunk nearly three quarters of a bottle of Lafrague, um, which meant that the, the mouse movement was getting a little bit shaky. But we kind of walked through that one. And uh, I think great thanks to, to Archie, all the partners in Galloway Glens, and all the, the victims where even McNabb or myself or previously Helen or Jan has phoned them up and says, we've got an idea. And uh, those ideas would come along and uh, we'd try and deliver them. And most of the time it went really well. So a big thank you from Galloway Glens to the audience and a big thank you uh, to the audience in the room and all our partners. And this is the final one. Goodbye. Oh.